down one level and look specifically at the human capital issues, the people issues. And I think that the main challenge here is it's not one challenge, it's a host of different issues. And I would give them, put them into three different buckets. The first is the most talent doesn't even know about government service, does not even think about government service as public service anymore. We've done the only research on the question of how to entice talent into government in a cost-effective and sustainable way on the civilian side. Military has done a ton of work on this. And what we found is, by and large, most talented people on university campuses, even or older Americans, simply don't think about government jobs. They don't think about a job that might be right for them, and they have no idea how they could pursue a, a job that might actually be of interest to them. The second bucket is the hiring process. I've heard it discussed. However, in fact, it's four different issues, not one, and the challenge is to focus on all four of them. From the applicant experience, it's too slow. That's what everyone focuses on. It's too difficult, and it's non-transparent, meaning you don't know where you are in the process. You might be willing, you're willing to wait those 80 days, the hiring model, which I'd love to discuss if you want to, if you knew it was in fact going to be 80 days, but you don't. It's a black hole. You know what that FedEx package is, where it is. You don't know where your job application is in government. And again, I'm speaking in generalities because there's some places in government that do it right. And in fact, almost everything that needs to happen in government <clears throat> is happening somewhere, not everywhere. And that's also an important fact to be focused on. So the second bucket is this hiring process, too slow, too difficult, non-transparent from the applicant side. And most important, that something that the applicant doesn't see is that government often hires wrong. It doesn't choose the right person after that. And truth be told, whether you hire quickly or slowly, if you hire poorly, doesn't matter. And that's an aspect that no one pays attention to. Then the third piece is what happens to the folks once they arrive. And when I say arrive, that's from the point at which they get the job offer to the first year, the onboarding experience, and then their longer term tenure. And again, the government by and large does a very poor job here. It doesn't invest in its talent. It doesn't uh, provide the development and training experiences. It doesn't provide the kind of management that people want and need both to stay and to give of their discretionary energy. And I think if you focus on that broader map and then you envision what kinds of solutions you need to address those set of issues, then you're going to make a real difference here. And there's a ton of things for you to do. And there's some things that have already started. Hiring process, wonderful piece of legislation that Senators Akaka and Voinovich have introduced in the Senate something that it would be terrific for uh, this committee to, to, to try to, to work on here. We believe there should be an applicant bill of rights. Uh, we should believe that that applicant bill of rights should guarantee uh, to applicants that they have a timely, uh, easy, and transparent hiring process. And there's information for all of that, absolutely vital. We believe that the government should be investing in leadership training. Uh, we believe that uh, we need to see uh, a Serve America Act, which got signed by the President yesterday, that doesn't just deal with community and volunteer service, but actually deals with government service. The notion of a Roosevelt Scholar as a civilian ROTC program. Again, that's something that would make a very big difference to the talent market. Education's become real expensive. Military gets 40% of its talent from the ROTC program. A civilian counterpart would make a lot of sense. So I'd love to have a, an opportunity to talk further about this and many other issues and hope that the partnership can be of help. Thank you, Mr. Steyer. Mr. Bransford? Uh, Mr. Well, Chairman, I'm members of the subcommittee, the Senior Executives Association appreciates the opportunity to share its views uh, that concern the state of the federal workforce, especially those that uh, concern the Senior Executive Service. SEA has, for the past 28 years, represented the interests of career federal executives. The government is facing a critical juncture, problems with pay and performance management systems, the hiring and acquisition processes, and potential onslaught of retirements threaten to reduce the effectiveness and quality of the federal workforce. It is imperative that reform efforts be undertaken uh, to address these issues. Uh, before pr proceeding to specific SES issues, I'd like to address something that's been discussed already. It's the, the crazy quilt of the personnel and pay systems that has developed in the executive branch as many agencies have sought and received authority for separate personnel and pay systems. This is true both generally and specifically for the executive corps. This proliferation has hindered oversight. It's prevented coherent human resource policy development and management of the government's most valuable resource, its employees. The consideration of the problems that have resulted from this proliferation is one worth undertaking and essential if we are to see tr uh, truly significant change. An important component to this significant change is effective leadership at the highest levels of the civil service. Uh, given the critical issues facing our country, we believe it is imperative that career, career leadership be strengthened. 
Career executives provide continuity and expertise necessary to ensure critical programs are run effectively. To restore career leadership, SEA recommends that all agencies fill the position of Assistant Secretary of Administration uh, with a career senior executive. Also, we believe that cabinet level agencies should have at least one career senior executive at the principal deputy assistant secretary level for each assistant secretary or comparable position and the chief positions, for example, chief human capital officer and chief fiscal officer, uh, to the extent practicable, be filled by a career appointee. Another serious human resource challenge is the current SES pay and performance management system. SEA believes the system needs to be modified to ensure that quality applicants will aspire to the SES and those already in the SES will want to stay. An unfortunate pattern is developing among quality GS 14 and 15 employees to the effect that they're not interested in becoming a senior executive. This is due in large part to the skewed risk and reward ratio that senior executives face. Senior executives take on more duties, work longer hours, yet receive no compensatory time, no locality pay, and no guaranteed annual comparability raises, all of which are part of the compensation system for the GS employees. Furthermore, SES annual pay increases have not kept up with GS increases over the past several years because increases in the executive schedule, which sets the caps for SES pay, have lagged behind GS increases. Today, a GS 15 Step 10 earns a salary that is well into the range for SES pay. A 2008 OPM survey found that only 50% of senior executives believe that the current, pay, current SES pay and performance management system was helpful in recruiting qualified applicants for SES positions. This mirrored similar findings in a 2006 survey undertaken by SEA. What is clear after four cycles in this new pay and performance management system that was meant to relieve pay compression uh, and to be transparent and flexible and reward performance has instead become a disincentive for many of the best candidates to the senior executive service. To correct this risk-reward ratio, SEA proposes providing guaranteed annual increases with a locality pay component for to all senior executives rated as fully successful or better, and including performance awards in a senior executive's high three annuity calculations. The federal hiring process is another area in need of reform, especially for senior executives. OPM recently started a pilot program to attempt to streamline the process. And while SEA supports these initiatives, we do have concerns uh, with OPM's experimental use of virtual QRBs. A QRB, or Qualifications Review Board, is an important merit system safeguard that protects the career SES from politicization and assures that only qualified candidates become executives. Traditionally, these QRBs have been in-person meetings. Our concern is that a QRB that is too virtual will not be able to carefully and fully assess executive qualifications. By implementing necessary reforms now to both the SES system and at all levels of the federal workforce, many problems can be addressed before they become intractable. SEA looks forward to working with Congress, OPM, and the administration to find creative solutions to ensure that the federal government's human resource management practices appropriately serve the workforce, federal agencies, and the American public. Thank you, Mr. Bransford. Uh, Ms. Niehaus, for five minutes. Thank you for this opportunity to present our views before the subcommittee. Um, please keep in mind that I'm here on my own time and of my own volition representing the views of FMA, and I do not speak on behalf of the Air Ms. Force. Ms. Niehaus, is, is your mic on? Yeah. There we go. Okay. Is that better? My, that's much better. Thank you so much. Today, the civil service finds itself at a critical juncture. As roughly half of all federal workers become eligible for retirement within the next decade, Congress must set an aggressive agenda to avoid a potentially disastrous retirement tsunami and promote confidence in government. In our written statement, we make several recommendations to assist in federal recruitment and retention, as well as to prompt other needed changes to make federal employment more attractive. I'd like to address <coughs> some of them now. One of the many impediments potential employees face when considering a career in public service is the length of time it takes to navigate bureaucratic procedures during the hiring process. Most job vacancies take at least three months to be filled um, and upwards of a year if a security clearance is necessary. If the federal government takes a reputation, seeks a reputation as the premier employer, it's essential that agencies operate in a fashion that most efficiently and effectively meets their own needs and the needs of those they seek to hire. 
It's our experience that many applicants are more interested in serving the public than a particular agency. An individual seeking employment may apply for a position in one agency because that's where the vacancy is presented, but they may be more than willing to work for several other, vacancies, several other agencies. The government must do a better job in reaching out to these applicants. It's a shame to hear potential employees express frustration with the federal <clears throat> hiring process and give up on a career in civil service. Legislation introduced in the Senate gives to, seeks to drastically reform the process by which the federal government hires individuals into public service. The bill requires agencies to post job announcements in plain language and provides timely updates on each application status. The bill further mandates agencies develop workforce plans based on hiring needs and that no position be vacant for more than 80 days. The men and women in search of employment in public service will not wait months, let alone a year, for the government to contact them before looking for other work. It's essential that Congress consider this common sense proposal to capitalize on the current interest in public service. As the federal government competes against the private sector, agencies must take advantage of the tools at their disposal to recruit talented workers into public service. The use of added incentives may ultimately persuade individuals on the fence, especially if they have to endure a lengthy hiring process. Monetary payouts and student loan repayments have proven successful recruiting tools. Based on information gathered from 41 agencies by OPM, the use of recruitment incentives increased by 95% from 2006 to 2007 and proved critical in accomplishing strategic human capital goals. In 2007, agencies distributed over 7,000 incentive payments, totaling nearly $58 million. While federal agencies <coughs> award themselves high marks for allocation of those payouts, the usage of student loan repayment programs is woefully deficient. Of the 83 agencies reporting, only 33 provided that benefit to their employees. While this marks a 15% increase over 2006, we're still falling short of where we need to be. Since all agencies responding noted that student loan repayment had a positive impact on recruitment and retention, more agencies should be taking advantage of this program. I would now like to address the need for proper training within the government. Current law requires agencies to establish a training program for managers. However, there is no accountability for managers to participate, and during times of strange budget, strained budgets, training is typically the first program to meet the chopping block. An agency's ability to meet its mission directly correlates to the quality of workforce management. If an agency promotes an individual to managerial status but fails to develop the individual's supervisory skills, that agency severely jeopardizes its capability to deliver the level of service the American public expects. The development of managerial skills is one of the greatest investments an agency can make, both in terms of productivity gains and the retention of valued employees. We at FMA support legislation introduced in the Senate which requires agencies to provide interactive instructor-based training within one year of promotion to management and every three years thereafter. If the federal government is to stand as the employer of choice, we must remain dedicated to advancing policies that strengthen the core principles of the civil service. Whether developing recruitment incentives or enhancing existing programs, we must understand that the government's most important resource is the men and women who devote their lives to the public good. Consideration of the suggestions discussed in my testimony will facilitate our efforts to confront the challenges posed by an evolving workforce. Thank you again for the opportunity to express our views, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, and thank you for the timeliness of your, your remarks. Uh, as, a, as a member of Congress, I, I get to speak before a lot of student groups, and uh, especially a lot of high school groups. Uh, several weeks ago, I spoke to uh, the junior and senior classes at Mount St. Joseph. Uh, it's a local Catholic school in my district. And I talked to a lot of college groups as well. And uh, part of my riff, if you will, is, is talking about public service and about the, the wonderful opportunities, the, the interesting areas where people work, what we do. And I get the sense that uh, in some cases it's the first these kids have heard of it. Uh, and I don't think we do a good job at selling ourselves uh, in terms of uh, the career opportunities that, that are existing in, in public service. And, and you all hit on that issue. Uh, now, Mr. Steyer, I know that your group has worked uh, uh, basically to try to facilitate communication between students who might be prospective uh, uh, federal uh, uh, career people and uh, between the students and, and the agencies. And I think perhaps 
your your experience, your observations in in in, in doing that would would help the committee if we could hear about that. And and again, I, I guess the second part of my question would be to all three of you is. Are, are there certain specific regulatory changes or le lo changes in law that that would allow us to move people into uh, federal service much more quickly and, and in a better way, as you say? It's not just about doing it faster, it's doing it right. Uh, but getting the, those right candidates into positions that they, they would be, uh, I guess, maximizing their potential and, and as well, uh, some of the folks we need to pull into public service, especially with respect to the TARP program and, and this financial services oversight, we need experienced people that are, right. that are right now in the private sector and understand how, how this system works. Uh, we got to get them in too, sort of a lateral uh, shift. So uh, that's a long question, but could you talk about your experience and, uh, and are there any changes that you think could be adopted uh, in a timely fashion that might address the need. Sure. Look, and, and you put your finger on, as I indicated, the first bucket. People don't, are simply not aware about the opportunities for, in government for them. And that's true both for younger talent as well as more experienced talent. And we've done research for both cohorts. So you have the exact same problem. Government really hasn't been in the business of recruiting uh, for a very long period of time. You saw a downsizing of about 400,000 jobs in the 1990s. And government, by and large, is way behind the game. Your point, which is that um, the world is changing real fast, government has simply not kept up. And we're not doing the kinds of things that you need to build relationships over time with the talent market uh, that are necessary. There are a lot of things to be done. We have a program called Student Ambassadors. In fact, we know from our research that the most effective mechanism of interesting people is to hear from near peers. People, new people in government who've just come in, who are excited about their job, they're going back to their alma mater, uh, and they're the ones that are going to be more credible with the, the, their, 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 their near peers about the opportunities and the advantages of going into government. Government typically uh, recruits in, from the perspective of its own organizational image as opposed to what the talent market is interested, meaning that you have people going out from the Department of Energy or Department of Homeland Security talking about their agency, they should be talking about the career path and career pattern that the talent is interested in. Engineering careers in government, IT careers in government, you know, uh, you name it, that's the way it has to present. And we've done a ton of work on this, which we'd be happy to share uh, with you if it's at all useful. And there are very specific things that Congress can do. If there is one thing that is most important, however, it is in helping promote a sense of prioritization of these talent issues in the executive branch and the leadership. Having you ask questions, not just of Director Barry, who I think has a great vision of what needs to happen. People talked about OPM here. OPM is important, but truth be told, this is a government-wide issue. If you look at any well-run organization, it's the top leadership that pays attention to talent, not just their HR function. OPM can do a lot better, but can never do the job on its own. We actually need to see every single agency stepping up its game and leadership in every agency prioritizing the issue of talent if you really want to see real change. And that, that would be the, 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 the most important thing that could possibly happen. And I want to make sure there's some time for colleagues here. I'd like to focus a little bit on what slows down the federal hiring process. First of all, it's a merit system. We want to make sure we get the most qualified person. Secondly, there's veterans' preference, which is a very, very important component, but it does require uh, agencies to go through certain processes, and there are, have been efforts by OPM to simplify that and, and shorten the time period, but it does take more time to consider it. Then there's the security clearance process, which has been backed up for, uh, for a long time now. OPM's made some progress, but it still takes six to eight months to get a security clearance. Then there's a, a plethora of hiring flexibilities that, um, uh, that agencies can use. Sometimes they're confused about that. Uh, traditionally, before those hiring flexibilities were developed, you were hired off a civil service register. Um, and uh, now with the hiring flexibilities, people come in as accepted service, they're converted to competitive service. So it's kind of all over the place on how you, how you come into the federal government. And then I heard, and I'm not an expert to talk about this, but a couple of months ago I was at a, at a talk which featured a retired OPM executive who talked about what went wrong in 1979, 1980 with the Civil Service Reform Act, and that executive talked about the fact that there was supposed to be a delegation of examining authority 
from OPM to agencies, and, and the concern was that it had not really happened like it was supposed to. And I, I think it's happened somewhat, and like I said, I'm not a personnel technician expert to talk about that, but I think it's worth looking into to what extent has that been part of the problem. Ms. Niehaus? Um, the delegated examining um, units that OPM has established, I know Air Force has one of them for our Air Reserve technicians, and it, we do hire them faster than we do the other employees because of that, because they have a specific unit, they have an, uh, uh, they do maintain a roster of people, uh, so to speak, for the different positions. So I think the delegated examining authority is, is a good one to use. But I also do think that the security clearances are, I work for the Air Force, um, security clearances slow down almost every applicant that we have. Um, even those that we have who are perhaps uh, retiring military or, um, air res or reservists on the side who want to come in and be either air reserve technicians or civil service employees, their security clearances don't always transfer over so that, that we have to go through the process with them again. Um, I think that if we could make things clearer on USA Jobs, we get phone calls on a regular basis from people complaining that they can't find the announcements. They don't understand the announcements. The process takes too long. Um, streamlining that and going with the simple language, the plain language job announcements, um, and giving people a status report. If, if you apply for a job and 60 days later you haven't heard a thing from anybody, uh, most people are going somewhere else to look. They're not waiting it out. Uh, just on a couple of those points, I, I don't know if you were here for the director of, of OPM, uh, Mr. Berry's testimony, but he did list the uh, security clearance issue as one of his top three priorities, so he understands how long that is taking, and uh, he has expressed a, uh, an interest and an intent to shorten up that, uh, to streamline that whole process, so uh, that, that was good news. Uh, let me ask you, the, the whole overlay system, which is what we're looking at here, uh, where o OPM has uh, been given the responsibility of, of tying this framework together for all of these government agencies rather than having everybody doing their own thing, which is causing uh, chaos. It's causing competition between agencies. It's causing uh, employees who are doing the same thing, same work, side by side, uh, to be paid drastically different different wages and benefits, uh, which which I think undermines a cohesive and, and positive morale in these jobs. Uh, not to mention that I think it's illegal, but it's just the way the system has has evolved. I I shudder to think what a class action lawsuit uh, might do to our own agencies, because if you read the text of the law, what is required, we we don't seem to be adhering to our own legal standards. So that, that troubles me greatly. And I, I think there are enough industrious attorneys out there that at some point we're, we're going to be called on that. So it, it would behoove us, I think, to, to adopt a system where people who are doing equal work with equal energy and equal uh, uh, effectiveness get paid equally. And uh, that, that's not happening right now. But what do you think about the, uh, the role of OPM? It, it is certainly uh, and I don't know if it was because of what happened in, in the early 80s with, uh, uh, you know, civil service reform. I think there was a delegation there in, in part. Uh, I think in some cases agencies just got frustrated with the lack of progress and just said, hey, look, I'm going to take this responsibility on myself to try to get some, some things accomplished. And so now we have a, a very uh, patchwork system. It's not even a system. It's an ad hoc uh, arrangement where agencies are doing their own thing. Uh, and, and I'm just trying to think about how a new system, a recreated system with OPM involved, how, how, how they would integrate into that system and, and how they would interface with the agencies and just pro provide a general framework within which these agencies would work in their hiring, their promotion, their, their uh, retention. Uh, you know, all of those things that, that, are, that are so important to our workers, because you've all said it, you've all said it, you know, our success is going to depend on how we treat our workers. And uh, we are supposed to be leading by example in the federal government. We're supposed to be the best employer, the one with the, the best ideas, the one that respect 
the, the commitment of our federal employees uh, uh, to the highest degree, and, and I don't see that happening here. It's been, you know, one administration does it this way, another administration does it that way. There's no continuity here. And I think it's hurt the morale of some of our federal employees, although I am, I am impressed by so many of the employees that I meet with the, the, the energy and, and the, uh, the, the goodwill and, and the positive attitudes that they bring to their jobs every day. But uh, if, if you could talk about the OPM overlay and how, do you, how you see that, that working out. Um, look, I, I think that uh, there's obviously a whole host of issues that you've identified there. Um, my own view, you know, the 9-11 Commission to me said it best, and they said the quality of the people is more important than the quality of the wiring diagram. And I think this town is a town that loves to focus on wiring diagrams because it's something that seems a little bit more tangible you can get your arms around. And I think that at the end of the day, while wiring diagrams are relevant, it's really the, the you know, the culture quality issues that are most important. My own view is that OPM isn't doing what it needs to do, uh, that there are a lot of things that it ought to be doing that it can do within the existing system. I think it needs to own leadership development. It needs to own the full workforce. I think one of our challenges here is that we have a workforce that's the same direct headcount as it was during the 1960s. And the difference is that the government, government's gotten bigger, but you've got $532 billion being spent on contractors. Well, I don't think you really have anybody imagining strategically what really the contractor workforce ought to be doing. How do we ensure that we have the right talent inside to manage those external resources? How do we make sure that we always have you know, the, the, the internal uh, capacity to get done things that are important for the public good? Uh, and that strategic approach to full and complete workforce is something that I think rightly belongs with OPM. Leadership development, full workforce, and it needs to be a facilitator of better uh, activity amongst the agencies. Because by and large, right now, I don't think that OPM has the capacities to help agencies keep up with that changing world which you described earlier. And if I think if, I th I think if they provided that expertise, they would be enhancing their role a great deal. I think Director Barry has outlined a whole set of important priorities. There's a lot for them to do. I think the reality, though, as I tried to state earlier, is that we have to imagine this as a total government issue and not one localized at OPM because OPM will never, no, OPM can be part of the problem and part of the solution, but it can never be the full solution. And the tendency, honestly, my, my ex view is that the tendency is for folks to point, say, the problem is OPM, the problem is OPM, when they ought to be owning uh, responsibility a fair bit themselves. I think DOD is a great example. They do a fabulous job in imagining what they need in terms of their workforce planning, their talent acquisition, their talent development. Uh, that's a, a very interesting model, and side by side you have close to 700,000 civilian employees. And when I talk to the, you know, the head recruiting general at the Army, and I'm like, why is it that you're not applying the same kind of principles to your civilian workforce as you do to your military? He's like, ah, oh, it's OPM's fault. And when I looked at the general, I was like, that cannot be. If that general cared enough about it, if he prioritized it, he would get things done differently. Uh, yeah. Your OPM or no OPM. So partly my answer to you is that there are some very concrete things that OPM can and ought to do. It needs to imagine itself in a different role. It needs to be able to upgrade its own talent so it can provide that facilitation. And, uh, but other agencies have to do likewise. And then the final point I would make is this transparency information point. We don't know a lot of things we need to know. Delegate Norton asked the question about the 80-day hiring model. Truth be told, we don't know how long it takes to hire in the government. Um, one of the suggestions that we've made, and I think it's incorporated in the legislation in the Senate, is that we simply map the hiring process for every agency. Every agency map its hiring process and make that process public so that you actually understand what happens in, in, in the hiring. And I will tell you something interesting. We, we did a, a project which we called the Extreme Hiring Makeover. We worked with three different agencies. We went in. That was our starting point. We mapped the hiring process. One agency, 110 steps, 45 people touched every single hire. As bad as that sounds, that's nothing compared to the fact that they didn't know. They did not know what their own hiring process was, and that's why it became what it was. Worse than all of the other two things I just said is that they got the wrong person at the end of the process because they never had a conversation at the beginning between the program manager who needed to hire someone and the HR professional who was setting the requirements for the process. So they, didn't, they couldn't have gotten the right answer even after going, going through that Rube Goldberg contraption. And my point here is that we need better information. Things like the Federal Human Capital Survey, 
hugely important. We produce our best places to work rankings based on it, but it really only happens every other year because OPM only does it every other year. It ought to happen every year. We ought to have real-time operational information. You ought to have that so that you can perform your oversight function and we can manage better. You can't manage what you don't measure and we don't measure the right things in government today. Right. It is exciting to hear Director Barry talk about his efforts to uh, look at and try to do something about the balkanization of the pay systems. Um, that kind of leadership has, has not been apparent from OPM in, in the recent past, and I think it's OPM's role is one of leadership. Uh, to give you one example of what they did, uh, what OPM did in the SES area, is they took it and divided it into four discrete items so that the policy people who made policy decisions about the way the SES should be run had nothing to do with the people who actually gave advice to agencies on a day-to-day -day basis. So they really didn't understand or know, other than periodic meetings they might have, uh, about the differences between the two. And I think uh, understanding the issues and problems with the government, working with the agencies, and having a direct direct connection with the people who develop policies and, and strategy and, uh, and then actually leading federal agencies to reform. And then I think the agencies uh, will, will fall in line if they have a clear vision of what's expected and they understand that they're very much expected to do these things. I think they will do them. Mr. Hughes? I think that um, Max's idea of, of mapping the hiring process and making it public is a great one. I think that OPM could then use that to possibly create a, a general wiring diagram to more um, homogenize mm. the different processes that various agencies are using. I know even within DOD there's a, a large variety because of the centralization of personnel systems. Um, Air Force has one central personnel system. Army and Navy have regionalized their personnel um, office, their main personnel offices. And I think if, if there was one main diagram for a, agencies to follow, they would be able to be more consistent among each other. Um, I do agree about the pay system. I know we um, have nurses at our medical facility, which is one of the largest in the Air Force, working alongside a VA clinic. The VA nurses in that clinic um, have much better pay than our nurses do as RNs. And we do lose them to the VA right next door on the same installation. Um, so I, I do and think my VA hospitals, I have three in my district, mm -hmm. uh, they're losing their, their people to the private uh, hospitals, so it's, yeah. it's sort well, of a domino We're in the San Francisco Bay effect. Area, so we see a lot of that, too. Yeah. Uh, in, your, in your opening remarks, Mr. Steyer, you talked about the, the possibility that we could have the federal government hiring up to 600,000 people in the next four to five years. I think that may be a little high, but only because of the economy has, has cut uh, you know, the retirement funds of, about, of all of our federal employees by about 40 percent, at least their thrift saving plans and those 401k type plans. So I think some of our folks that were going to go out the door are probably rethinking that, uh, that decision now. But in any event, even if it's on the low end of 400,000, you still got a lot of people that are coming into public service uh, very shortly. And it makes it increasingly important that we have our system, uh, we plug the holes and, and try to make sense out of this thing before we have this, this you know, surge in hiring so that we bring people in and we, we train them properly in this next wave uh, of, of hiring. So it's incredibly important that we, we get this done. Uh, as you can tell, there are four other hearings going on at the same time. I'm actually supposed to be in another one down the, down the hall. But uh, uh, l let me ask you, rather than uh, you know, following a strict you know, question and answer format, uh, are, there, are there issues, just as the two panels before you, I, I asked sort of toward the end uh, if there were points uh, that they wanted to, that the panelists wanted to amplify. Uh, just in terms of importance and priority, things that, that you think, if there's a couple of things that you think absolutely have to happen uh, going forward here as we, as we embark on this next wave of hiring, are there, are there a couple of points that you think absolutely uh, must happen in order to give us any chance at all of success? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think as we move forward, it's important um, 
to have OPM exercise a leadership role. It's important to have the agencies take that seriously. And I would, I would recommend and, and encourage uh, the administration to utilize career senior executives to a greater extent than they have over the past 15 years. It provides the continuity and expertise in running government programs uh, that last over a long time, that makes a meaningful difference, that helps in the, in the strategic development of programs, and to create a partnership between OPM and the agencies on the management of, of its human capital. And a, a great tool is the Chief Human Capital Officers Council uh, to do that. But I think it's wonderful that this subcommittee is looking at this issue. I think it's important to keep, keep a spotlight on it. And um, I'm encouraged by the remarks I heard this morning by OPM that as we move forward, uh, uh, there will be uh, some serious attention to some very important issues. Thank you. Um, yes, I think that as we, if we're going to grow our workforce by 4,000 or 7,000 civilians, I think we need to look at our current managers because they're going to be the ones who are going to be training those people. They're going to have the responsibility for the new people. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to focus on management training for them and make sure that the budgets are available so that that training doesn't get cut. Um, I know at my installation, that was one of the first things that was cut. None of the military education was cut, but civilian management training went right out the window. Um, so I think that needs to be a priority to make civil service more viable to have the management training there and to make it just as important as the military training. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. It is the first thing to go. And uh, to the point where it's, it's, been, it's been cut from every, every area, uh, you know, of our, our management system. Uh, and, I, and I think it was actually the director, uh, this morning of OPM, actually this morning, pointed out that fact that, uh, you know, we are void of any, any type of uh, organized and systemic training uh, protocol in, in federal government right now, and we're, we're suffering from that, that, that gap. Uh, Mr. Steyer? Well, absolutely. And I think just, I think these are great suggestions, and I would build off the point. We don't really know actually how much money and how much training is occurring. My, my, I believe that, the, that the, it's happening right now. The hiring, the, 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 out, the output of, of talent is occurring today. So you're put in a position where you're flying that plane and retooling the engine at the same time. And, and, and I think that the immediacy has to be understood. And partly what the priority ought to be um, is, is, you know, people have mentioned others, the hiring process, but really information. So to give you an example, the Department of Homeland Security lost three quarters of its career SES, I believe from, you know, 2003 to 2007. We can't tell you why. It's a, it's a damning number to lose three quarters of your, your, your career executives. But we don't do exit interviews. We don't, we don't actually collect the information that we really need to understand the problems. That's whether it's the amount of money we're spending on training, uh, what happens, why do people leave, what's the applicant experience uh, when they're applying to a job. We can tell you anecdotes, people can, and, and the anecdotes are fairly consistent. Uh, but you don't collect information and in a way make it uh, understandable such that you can actually manage effectively in government. And that's one of the things I would be demanding on your side. Uh, the information that will permit you to understand whether um, your actions are the most high leverage ones and have the most, uh, you know, uh, possibility. So if you start peeling back the onion, you look at the information, you find a target rich environment. We put out a report a week and a half ago, which I gave to Director Barry, about student intern hiring. Uh, and it's shocking. We don't actually know how many interns we have in the government. But our best count, looking at the two programs, step and step, not talking about volunteers or third-party internship programs, government converts only 6% of them into full-time employees. You know, a decent benchmark in other organizations is 50%. Why that discrepancy? Because we're not thinking about internships, student internships, as part of our talent pipeline. We're not prioritizing it. Well, there's some very easy solutions that we outlined in that report that this committee could pick up and that it would make a big difference if you paid attention to it. Um, but again, it's information, understanding that there's a problem there because you have that data. Well, in conclusion, I just want to thank you each for, for coming before this committee uh, and helping us with our work. I'm sure that we're, we're going to call upon you periodically for uh, help in, in devising a, a solution to, to at least part of the problems that we face. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
Oh no, it's in my remarks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in there. Okay, thanks. Hi. All right, I'm the third best looking one up here. It's been a long morning. Hi, Jim. How you doing? Hi, Greg. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Uh, welcome. Uh, let's see. It is the committee's policies that all witnesses ought to be sworn. Uh, may I ask you to rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that your testimony before this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Let the record show that all of the witnesses asked, answered in the affirmative. I've noticed that uh, the last couple of hearings we've had the uh, Employee representatives, uh, the union heads testify last. That is, that is not going to be the custom here, I assure you. Good. And I apologize for, for made, making you wait so long. Nor, nor will I uh, continue the practice of having so many panels. I think we could probably consolidate some of these and, and make it less painful for all of you. But uh, I, I do want to say thank you for your willingness to come before the committee and, and help us uh, as you've done. Uh, other, other occasions uh, when I was not the chair, and I, I appreciate that work as well. Let me first begin by introducing our distinguished panel. Uh, Colleen Kelly is the national president of the National Treasury Employees Union, the nation's largest independent federal sector union, representing employees in 31 separate government agencies. As the union's top elected official, uh, Ms. Kelly leads NTEU's effort to achieve the dignity and respect that federal employees deserve. Uh, Jacqueline Simon is the Public Policy Director for the American Federation of Government Employees, AFGE. AFGE watches over the rights of some 600,000 federal and D.C. government employees. An economist by training, Ms. Simon has worked to protect the interests of federal employees at AFGE for 20 years. Uh, Greg Juneman is President of the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. Uh, Greg Juneman is the president of the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. And in 2005, uh, Mr. Juneman was elected to the AFL-CIO Executive Council. And he serves as co-chair of two AFL-CIO committees, organizing and immigration, and also is a member of several AFL-CIO committees, including training and education, international affairs, political policy, state and local organizations, and public affairs. Uh, to all, welcome. Uh, why don't I uh, give each of you uh, five minutes to uh, make opening remarks, and, and then we'll, we'll go forward with questioning. Ms. Kelly. Thank you very much. President Chairman. Kelly, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chairman Lynch. It's an honor to be here at this hearing, and it is very good to hear so many agree that these are very exciting times in the federal service and for federal employees. 
The extent to which our government will be successful rests in large measure on the federal employees who are charged with carrying out the critical missions of their agencies. Again, something everyone today agrees on. During the last administration, the use of outside contractors skyrocketed, while staffing in many agencies was severely reduced. The IRS, for example, saw a 24 percent decrease in staffing levels over the past 12 years, despite staggering increases in workload. The new Congress has stepped up to the plate and included additional resources in both the House and the Senate passed budget resolutions for FY 2010 to address some of the most urgent staffing shortfalls at agencies like the IRS, the FDA, and the Social Security Administration. NTEU believes that resources can be found to further rebuild decimated staffing levels by discontinuing the inefficient and ineffective contracting out policies of the last administration. A very large number of contracts let by the federal government in recent years have been plagued by cost overruns and inadequate performance. I am very pleased that the Obama administration is reviewing agency contracting, and I am confident that savings can be found by bringing much of that work back in-house. Savings and productivity can also be increased when frontline employees are asked for their input into agency decision-making. In October of 1993, President Clinton issued an executive order establishing labor management partnerships in the federal government. That executive order was rescinded by President Bush soon after he took office. NTEU believes it is time to reinstate those partnerships in the federal government and to once again tap into the expertise of frontline employees. Attacks on collective bargaining by the previous administration also unfairly left large groups of dedicated employees without basic workplace rights. NTEU enthusiastically supports H.R. 1881 to provide collective bargaining rights and civil service protections to the employees of the Transportation Security Administration who have the lowest pay and the highest injury rate and the highest attrition rate in the federal government. I look forward to working with this Congress and the Obama administration to secure these rights for TSA. These challenging times require that the federal government is able to attract and retain the best. Many have talked about that today. Therefore, the benefits and pay must be competitive. FEHBP has good elements to it, but it is not without serious problems. Despite constant premium increases in the last eight years, the program has seen benefit and coverage cutbacks, higher co-payments, and the addition of new plans like high deductible health plans that undermine the integrity of the system. NTEU supports greater federal premium contributions by the government and a review to see how costs can be reduced for the 8 million federal enrollees. We also support extending the age for dependent coverage past age 22, as many states, including Massachusetts and Utah, have already done. We support allowing domestic partner coverage for federal employees under FEHBP. And we are in favor of H.R. 626 to provide parental paid leave for federal employees for the birth or adoption of a child. We also support pay parity. Federal employees are willing to do their part, but they deserve pay parity with military personnel, as has been the case for almost two decades. As Director Barry noted this morning, federal employees face, civilian federal employees face a 23 percent pay gap with the private sector, and the law that was supposed to close that gap, FEPCA, has never been fully implemented. As agencies look to rebuild their workforces, we should strive to make the hiring process more user-friendly and faster. Again, something everyone agreed on today. But we need to fix only what is broken while maintaining the federal merit principles. The Federal Career Intern Program is one example of a hiring alternative that is failing and needs to be ended. And this has nothing to do with the intern programs that have been talked about earlier. This is actually a hiring mechanism being used inappropriately by too many agencies. NTEU stands ready to work with this committee, with Congress, and with the administration to improve the hiring process. Finally, let me salute this subcommittee for its role in the House passage of H.R. 1804 and H.R. 1256. The package allows counting unused sick leave toward the FERS retirement calculation, correcting the CSRS problem for part-time service, and makes important thrift savings improvements, including automatic enrollment and a Roth contribution fund for those who choose it. NTEU strongly supports this bill and will work to ensure its enactment. The challenges facing our government are great and historically important. 
but the federal workforce is a strong, resilient, and capable one that wants to fully participate again as a partner in solving the many challenges ahead for our country. NTU looks forward to working with all of you to make this happen, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, and we'll answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Simon, for five minutes, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My statement focuses on federal hiring. It's important to remember that despite notions to the contrary, the private sector's hiring methods are neither instantaneous nor trouble-free. Trouble and in addition, while the federal government has some problems in hiring, it's not the bumbling caricature it's so often portrayed to be. Moreover, the problems with federal hiring are not caused by adherence to the merit system principles or veterans' preference. Hiring the next generation of federal employees is a serious undertaking. Those charged with this task have a legal and social responsibility to conduct hiring in the most open and fair manner possible. And the plain fact is that openness and fairness take time. Federal agencies must honor veterans' preference. Internal candidates who were selected into career ladder positions must be given the opportunities they've been promised. Background checks and security clearances have to be conducted. Education and prior employment must be verified. Working for a federal agency is not the same as working for a private firm, and it takes time to make sure an applicant meets the standards and requirements our society expects the federal government to uphold. But there's no doubt that the application process could be streamlined without sacrificing these high standards. Many prospective employees point to the lengthy sections of applications that require them to describe in great detail their knowledge, skills, and abilities, KSAs. We've also seen de the demoralizing effect on current employees who must produce these lengthy, lengthy KSAs when they're applying for internal promotions. Elimination of the KSAs is worthy of consideration, but at a minimum, we think that only those who pass an initial level of scrutiny should be required to fill out KSAs. Another problem with federal hiring is that even when applicants meet the qualifications that are required and posted on the vacancy announcement, it's all too common for agencies to conceal additional accreditation requirements, which are even more critical to the position. These hidden accreditation requirements prevent applicants from qualifying for further consideration for a job, which is particularly infuriating when they learn about them after the fact and after they've spent hours filling out KSAs. While it's critical that OPM focus extensively on correcting the problems with federal hiring, there are many proposals that should be off the table. The previous administration had three answers to the challenge of federal hiring. Rehire annuitants without competition. Hire directly without competition. And hire contractors without competition. In the meantime, they were consolidating and privatizing human resource functions across the government, undermining the ability of agencies to utilize the normal competitive merit system hiring processes with any speed or efficiency. One of the many complaints we've heard is that federal hiring is too slow. One important explanation for the slowness, apart from the requirement for being thorough that I described above, is that between the indiscriminate downsizing of the 1990s and the privatization by the Bush administration, agency personnel offices have been decimated. There are simply too few personnel to handle the duties related to hiring in an expeditious way. The single most important and effective step in speeding up hiring would be to reestablish on-site personnel offices adequately staffed with federal employees. Although much emphasis is placed upon external candidates for federal jobs, the retention of current employees should also be a priority because they often make the best candidates for federal job openings. We hear from our members a recurring theme. Agencies prefer to bring in outside candidates at a grade just one level higher than the top grade for the incumbent workforce. For example, in an agency that has computer programmers ranging from grades 5 through 12, most of whom have worked in these positions for years, the agency will bring in a new programmer from the outside at grade 13 because it's easier to fill a grade 13 than to backfill a grade 5. The result is that opportunities for career development for internal candidates are cut off. They're left to train the newcomers who now hold the position to which they had aspired. This pra practice has a devastating impact on morale. The government should instead create and maintain meaningful merit promotion programs for the employees it's already invested in. In summary, AFGE supports four main policies that would greatly facilitate and expedite the recruitment and retention of the next generation of federal employees. 
Number one, restore through insourcing adequate numbers of federal human resources professionals to provide the support necessary for a hiring process that adheres to veterans' preference and the merit system principles. Number two, reform and streamline federal job applications and processes, in particular focus on alternatives to the controversial knowledge, skills, and abilities portion of the process. Number three, train agencies to focus as much attention on hiring from within their current ranks as is placed on attracting external candidates. And number four, take steps to close the pay gap between federal and non-federal pay for both general schedule and federal wage system employees. This concludes my statement. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, President Ginneman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank you, Chairman Lynch, and the members of the subcommittee for addressing this very important topic. Um, since my preamble has been, I think, uh, covered quite well and adequately, I'll skip right to uh, my the meat of my remarks. Uh, I went to, when I was, uh, found I was scheduled to testify here today, uh, we reached out to uh, all of our uh, federal area locals and asked for their input on what they thought this committee should address. So I'll get right to that. Uh, repairing the damage of the civil service uh, workforce and preserving it into the 21st century will not happen without significant effort across the legislative and executive branches of government. We look forward to seeing this subcommittee play a major role in that effort. On behalf of the federal workers that IFPT represents, uh, we respectfully submit the following proposals for your consideration. Uh, this committee should work to repeal uh, finally and fully the disruptive and punitive national security personnel system. My entire union sees this uh, bill as uh, nothing more than assault on the dedicated civilian uh, uh, defense workforce. Secondly, scrutinize and reform the contracting out of federal work. While IFPTE, which in addition to representing tens of thousands of federal workers, also represents uh, tens of thousands of workers in the private sector, is not opposed to privatization when it makes sense and is done in a fair, proper, and prudent manner that benefits the nation. Current federal contracting out policies are heavily skewed in favor of privatization and need to be overhauled. Refederalization should be considered for those Bush administration outsourcing efforts that have failed to meet promise savings and quality metrics. Uh, third, uh, mandate uh, increased management training. IFPTE supports the passage of the Federal Supervisor Training Act of 2009 uh, that has uh, been sponsored by Senator Akaka. Fourth, uh, reinstate federal management partnership. I applaud the remarks earlier from Director Barry, and IFPTE sees tremendous value in partnerships and urge the rebirth within, with the inclusion of language that establishes method, means, and technology as bargaining obligations. Fifth, extend civil service protections within the executive branch, uh, within the executive branch to the legislative branch. In other words, Congress has to remember its own employees. Uh, IFPTE asked the subcommittee and the full committee to work with the House Administration Committee to ensure that workers of the legislative branch enjoy the same benefits as their brethren uh, within the executive branch. Six, act to preserve America's leadership in aerospace, science, and technology. Uh, this is done in two ways. First, by calling for the appropriations that uh, increase in-house research and development funding for federal research institutions, including funding for strategic hiring. And second, adopt legislation uh, mapping uh, the use of, of term limits, I'm sorry, capping uh, the use of term positions and prohibiting um, the use of accounting methods that seek full cost recovery of civil service salary. Finally, take additional actions, as I'm outlining here, uh, which include reduce the increasing burden of health premiums on federal workers, um, give and uh, give federal employees under, well, this has already been done, I guess, by the House, uh, so I'll get back to that. We applaud the House for uh, giving federal employees under FERS the ability to um, use their unused sick leave uh, and uh, provide the same employee benefits afforded to opposite sex married federal workers, to domestic partners, and to same sex married partners, married couples and repealed windfall elimination provision and government pension offset. 
and increase and enhance pension and annual leave benefits for administrative law judges, and finally raise the cap on GS-15 salary. Uh, we'd like to thank you again for allowing us to uh, participate and uh, testify before the committee today, and I will uh, answer any questions you might have. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your patience in, in uh, waiting for others to testify. And uh, I'd like to get right, right to a couple of issues that I've been thinking about for some time. I know that in, in uh, President Kelly, uh, in 1998, uh, Congress authorized various personnel flexibilities uh, related to staffing, performance, and pay for IRS employees. And I know you, you represent those folks. Uh, how have the flexibilities uh, impacted the situation at, at the IRS. Uh, what what are, what have been the outcomes? Have you seen it uh, abused or or underused? Uh, what has been the the actual experience on the ground at, at the IRS? And would you recommend it, any regulatory modifications to that that whole exercise? Actually, at the IRS, they have used very few of the flexibilities. And um, it usually comes down they decide not to allocate the funding for it. Um, when you uh, look at specific issues such as recruiting and retention bonuses, they have used those for managers or for SES employees, but not for frontline employees. Student loan repayments, we have been working hard to try to have them acknowledge that that would help uh, in the recruiting and retention. And they just uh, have not. Um, either had the money or been willing to invest the money in, uh, in that for the workforce. So I think with, um, as with most agencies, they have a lot of flexibilities that they already have the authority to use, but they are not using them. And that was always one of NTU's frustrations when agencies would come forward and ask for more flexibilities, as if they don't already have enough. They have plenty and they just don't use them. Yeah. Uh, let me ask, um, Ms. Simon, I know that uh, that uh, well, we have a lot of folks coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq after multiple tours. Uh, we have a we have I, I think a a well-intended uh, veterans benefit uh, and veterans preference uh, uh, mandate out there. Uh, the folks that I meet, uh, I've been to Iraq uh, I think tw 11 or 12 times now, and I'm just uh, and. and Afghanistan probably a half dozen times, and I am, uh, without exception, uh, totally impressed at the young people and some of the not-so-young people that we got in uniform uh, doing a great job for us. And, you know, th these folks are very well-trained, uh, very well-educated, highly intelligent, highly motivated. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we get more of them? Uh, to to apply and and succeed in coming into the federal government and helping us with the civilian side of of, uh, of, of our government. How how do we do that? Because I I, I sense that there's some uh, there's some obstructions there as well. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that. We we estimate at AFGE that something close to half of our membership at any given time are veterans. And um, which is why we're not a veteran service organization, but we are very, very strong advocates of retaining veterans preference in hiring. Um, and I don't think it's too much to say that, at, that the majority of proposals that have, have been put before us, um, not just you know, this year, but in the, certainly in the last eight years, were thinly veiled attempts to evade veterans preference, particularly direct hiring. And, and people will whisper, um, you know, they'll, they'll give lip service to the importance of veterans' preference, but then whisper later, yeah, I can't hire anybody because I, I can only hire veterans. Um, I think that the attitude that you just expressed um, isn't as widespread as it ought to be. Um, in the agencies, and um, we certainly know that veterans make excellent federal employees. Um, I think there's also, um, you know, uh, we've all made 
vague reference at some point today to, um, and I mean this panel, um, to the devastating impact um, the last eight years have had on the federal workforce in terms of morale and, and even reputation. Um, administration that was at with its own work. Retiring federal employees were replaced as often as possible with contractors. And so I think that, you know, word is getting out that the federal government is back in business of hiring and, and the hostility has, has ceased and, and um, federal agencies are once again welcoming um, people to, to apply and with the expectation that they'll be hired and, and treated fairly. And so I think that, you know, we're really just getting started here trying to uh, undo some of the damage that has been done in the last eight years. Um, you know, it was delightful listening to the previous panels and talking about the federal workforce in such a positive way. And I think that combined with the unfortunate um, fact that the private sector is reeling, um, the federal government um, hiring uh, should be in a, in a pretty good position. Are there... Are there... Uh are there refinements or modifications in the current veterans preference model that might make it easier uh, or, or make us more successful in attracting uh, uh, some of our servicemen and women coming back? The thing that we hear over and over again, which you've probably heard over and over again, is the difficulty people have in, in a lot of occupations um, of filling out these lengthy KSA yeah. Um, yeah. forms. Um, there are a lot of federal jobs that really don't require the ability to um, write these long essays. And um, that's why we're, we're very supportive of efforts to try to streamline this application process and get away from the emphasis on written KSAs. Yeah, and I heard earlier, very earlier today, uh, uh, Director uh, Berry, who said, you know, basically we've gone to a system where uh, potential candidates for federal employment have to go to a, an agency to help them basically interpret uh, or reinterpret their their work history in a way that applies to the, you know, the federal hiring process, uh, you know, data, the KSA uh, filings and, and all of that. So it's become so archaic and, and uh, specialized that there are actually folks out there that, you know, you would, you would think that a person of, you know, uh, competent intelligence could fill out a form to describe their their own work history in in an effort to to get a federal job but that is clearly not the case and I think it's illustrative of the problem that we're facing I think um, when when he was talking about that it reminded me of something that um, you'll probably hear a lot more about um, the sort of biggest uh, complaint <clears throat> that our members at the Social Security Administration have in the last eight years their jobs um, went from um, being uh, helping members of the public apply for the benefits to which they were entitled um, from you know sort of being gatekeepers of those benefits and and in response um, firms uh, uh, sort of a, a cottage industry of firms uh, uh, were created to help people apply for social security benefits um, the fact that there are so few personnel officers who could actually pick up the phone and answer an applicant's question about how do I actually do this. Um, there's no reason that people, that we can't have HR staff who could actually help applicants through the process. But um, if you see our, our written statement, um, you know, the, the Bush administration had this lines of business of initiative with HR that virtually required every federal agency to outsource to a so-called center of excellence for HR functions. And as a result, um, there's really nobody left for the most part in agencies, certainly nobody who can actually help a, an applicant fill out the form. Yeah. Well, and I, I would be remiss if I did not say thank you, uh, you know, to, to, to each of you. I know that uh, AFGE and NTU and, and your own group, uh, President and gentlemen, has been very aggressive in, in, high, in getting uh, veterans into in federal employment. We appreciate that. And AFGE, I, I think the percentage was 40 percent or some, something in that area. That's extremely high. That, that's a great, uh, that's a great tribute 
to, to your organization and you know your, your willingness to reach out and, and make sure that these these folks who have put on the uniform of this country uh, have an opportunity to come home and, and go to work in a, in a, in a decent job. I, I just I've thought of one more thing. Um, we some of these proposals for direct hiring or expedited hiring have um, wanted to try to make various other forms of experience equivalent to veterans preference in the hiring process um, up to and including having spent four years on a college campus getting a degree. Um, I don't know if you've seen those proposals, but you know we've reacted very negatively to to any effort to say, oh, okay, well, four years in college, you know, earning a, a bachelor's degree, it's very very hard work, is equivalent to having um, done a, a tour of duty in Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, it, it, those kinds of proposals have been offered with a straight face, and we just really um, have a very negative reaction to trying to equate any kind of educational experience to military service. Yeah, I, 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 would, uh, I would have a similar reaction to any attempt uh, such as that uh, to, sure. If I could just add, Chairman Lynch, this whole issue of veterans preference and in, in the hiring process, one of the things that I'm hoping that Director Barry will look at is um, the uh, potpourri list of hiring processes that agencies are using because one of the ones that um, we specifically cited in N2's testimony and I mentioned briefly is called the Federal Career Intern Program. It has nothing to do with an intern program. It was legislation that allowed agencies to use this hiring process for uh, literally for interns to for short-term assignments to kind of get to see their skills, maybe see where they fit best in the federal government. Well, uh, that FCIP program does not take into account veterans' preference. Totally ignores veterans' preference. Mm. Does not even mandate that it be, in, be considered. And today, Customs and Border Protection is using it to hire every frontline CBP officer, and they have 22,000 of them in the agency. Wow. So they are using it to hire every CBPO, the IRS is using it to hire every revenue agent and revenue officer, and the FDIC is using it to hire examiners. So wow. the program is being totally misused, and NTU's lawsuit um, asserts that it, it is not a merit principles uh, hiring system, uh, and specifically because of the total ignoring of the veterans preference issue. So whether this gets shut down by our lawsuit or by uh, Director Barry with uh, the new OPM taking a new look at this, I hope it will be shut down soon because tens of thousands of employees are being hired under this uh, program every year and totally misusing what the legislative intent of it was. Oh. This, Mr. Chairman, oh, could I? Certainly. Yeah, I, actually, Mr. Gentleman, I have some questions for okay. you as well, but you could jump in here. I, I'm but, surprised at that because you would think that Customs and Border Patrol, you know, all the hiring that's going on because of the situation on, on the Mexican border and other areas, uh, who better? Who better to hire than, you know, folks coming back with military backgrounds, uh, our veterans? I mean, that's a that's a perfect uh, uh, applicant pool. I, I would think they would have all the relevant skills and disciplines uh, that w would pertain to that job. Um, if you wanted to follow up on that, Mr. Gentleman, I also have some questions for you. But go ahead. Yeah, I I um, I need to say something on this because I've I've got a son who's a, a three-time veteran of Iraq. Uh, he's uh, I I dare say an ex-marine. He'd shoot me. He's a former marine. Uh, anyway, he's a three-time veteran of the Iraq War, and he also did a brief stint in Afghanistan. Uh, he told me, and again, maybe this is anecdotal, but he said this was not only for himself, but he found this among his fellow Marines. Um, there's very little let's call it marketing, being done by the federal government while people are in the military. And so if you're asking how do we get them in, wait, get them before they leave would be yeah. my answer. As a matter of fact, what he says is there's very little, um, very little attention paid to soldiers who are trying to get out because you're sort of competing with yourself. Because, you know, in that the, the military is so understaffed you know, that it would be difficult for the same federal government to say, please stay in, please re-up, you know, give us four more years, and at the same time saying, hey, there's career opportunities for you when you leave uh, on the civilian side. Yeah. So I think what's happening is before they're ever leaving, you know, they're, 
their, their uh, commanders are sort of hanging on to their ankles with both hands, uh, asking them not to leave. When they finally are convinced that they're going to leave, then it's, uh, it's really just a very short, uh, uh, a brief, not very effective uh, mechanism toward post-military careers. Uh, and I think what needs to be done is there needs to be marketing. If we really want these people, uh, you know, not to wait until they're done and then say, oh, we've got veterans preference now that you're unemployed. You know, what I think needs to be done is as the, to put out a, a career in federal government service and say, here's another avenue you might want to go into. We'll embrace you in that, in that right. avenue. Right. So, no, I think that's a great point and, and uh, one that I think is lost on most people. There is, a, there is a concerted effort, and has been uh, since uh, 2003, to get uh, our, our young men and women and, and experienced men and women in uniform to re-up. And uh, as you point out, if you're trying to do that, get them to re-enlist, it would be counterintuitive for you to also provide information and, and encouragement on taking uh, another job uh, in the federal government that would take those folks out of uniform. So, yeah, there's a, there's a conflict there. We have to figure out, uh, you know, interestingly enough, I've spent enough time in, in Iraq and Afghanistan to know that uh, w when these soldiers are getting towards the end of their, their tour, uh, they are online quite a bit. And they, you know, I know the ones in my district contact me about their prospects of going to work when they get home. And uh, they're nervous about that. There's a certain anxiety. They've been doing that for such a long time in uniform, and now they're stepping out. It's a big move for them. And uh, it just seems to me there ought to be, a, there ought to be an outreach on our part, uh, given the need that we now see in the federal government for, for uh, you know, new employees in various areas of uh, activity and, and responsibility. We should be reaching out to these folks affirmatively ourselves rather than just asking them to kind of figure their way uh, in, into federal employment. So uh, I think it's a great point you raise and one that uh, I'll certainly uh, discuss with uh, uh, Director Berry. One, one of the questions I had for you, uh, President Juniman, was is uh, a lot of your folks are, are you know, technically oriented. They're, uh, you know, you've got uh, engineers and scientists that, that work for you. And uh, it, it must uh, present a unique set of problems for you in terms of uh, what the competition from private industry uh, for those who have, uh, you know, an acumen in, in, in the sciences and, and, and uh, engineering. Uh, how, how has it worked out? How are those uh, problems that we've talked about earlier today, the hiring process, uh, both uh, initial hires and, and those who might be needed uh, in a lateral uh, hiring mode, how has that affected the, the folks that you represent? Well, we had, um, I'll go back a little bit to 2002, after, after September 11th, uh, a lot of our members, especially within the private sector, within, uh, you know, Boeing, we, we make a lot of, uh, a lot of my members are involved in uh, weapons systems. Uh, and as well as aircraft and aviation. Um, so Boeing, General Electric, uh, you know, GE, uh, Jet Engine, um, Westinghouse, Lockheed Martin, uh, the, a lot of them were experiencing reduction in force. A lot of them were going through layoffs. So I actually contacted uh, OPM, talked to Kay Coles James, and said, okay, look, if after September 11th the old rules don't apply, let's not apply them. I mean, let's look at this thing a little differently. If we've got a lot of these employees who have already passed uh, a lot of the security clearances, because, you know, in the, working in the private sector, and you need employees, and you're still hiring. You know, let's you know, let's go where the bass are biting. You know, and let's do hiring halls where the, where uh, uh, you know these people are suddenly finding themselves uh, close to being unemployed. Um, it sounded really good, but we still ran into that same uh, eight, nine, ten months uh, that it takes the federal government to hire an engineer. So we even knew, but even when they had security clearances, they still had to go through the same thing again. Um, th there's not really a, a great competition, I don't think, among uh, my members that uh, somebody wants to go, for instance, from, um, you know, uh, uh, 
Puget Sound uh, Naval Shipyard to go and work for Boeing because the people at Puget Sound really like what they're doing. They're committed to working and making you know, the, their little piece of the Navy that much more efficient and effective. Uh, more of the, and similarly with NASA, more of the problem I think comes into, uh, as I think was talked earlier, on, on setting forth career paths. And that's where, because of all of the problems that we've talked about here, you know, including, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the uh, non-pay for performance and non-recognition for performance, that they just, they, they don't see a career path in the federal sector that they should, you know. So I, that, yeah. that's what I've seen. That's what I've heard back from them. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you, uh, President Kelly, we had a similar situation in Andover, uh, north of my district uh, in Massachusetts. I have, I think, 1,700 accountants, auditors, uh, lawyers, you know, folks that, uh, uh, w with heavy backgrounds in financial services. And then we had uh, the, the oversight necessity of uh, this TARP program, the uh, Troubled Asset uh, Relief Program, and then also TALF, the Term Asset Back uh, uh, Loan Facility. And there's been a tremendous need for hiring the very people. That, now, they're laying off 1,700 IRS employees with the requisite skills in Andover, and they're hiring a few thousand uh, to do that type of work uh, within these new government programs. But I'm having a hard time to get people to talk to each other like, okay, there's folks over here you're laying off. And meanwhile, you're hiring new people and training them, a tremendous cost, not to mention that a lot of the folks at the IRS facility in, in, in Andover are already cleared for, cl for security clearances and have already been doing this work. They're experienced. You, you've, we've vetted them. Uh, some of them are 20-year employees. And now we're spending a whole lot of money vetting and doing clearances on new hires uh, worried about whether or not they can be trusted with the responsibilities that they're being given. How do we get folks to talk to each other? And, and uh, it would seem like a simple thing, like with the Puget Sound uh, example. And I, I actually had a, a unit from the Puget Sound in my district as well doing some engineering work. So, you know, I, I, I've seen all this happen as well. How do we get around that? How do we force people to talk to each other? Well, I've been trying actually to get information that you might have about what the qualifications are for these TARP jobs to do exactly what you're suggesting, which is to match them up with Andover. Um, so um, maybe you, you, know, you and I could talk and also get uh, Director Barry in this conversation because yeah. um, you are absolutely right. Those employees on September 30th up at Andover at the service center will be uh, no longer federal employees. And there's this work that needs to be done. But it has been what you describe in this situation, I have seen as an ongoing disconnect between agencies. This is one of the things I'm hoping that the new OPM um, will be able to, uh, to change about the way business has been done. One of the reasons I think agencies don't um, follow OPM's direction or they see them as recommendations rather than directives or because they don't see anything coming from OPM that they think will help them. I see agencies, when I think about, I was thinking about what do agencies tell me that they do with or to OPM. They go to OPM to ask for permission for something they need to ask permission for, or they go to OPM to ask for a waiver to not have to do something that they're supposed to be doing. Other than that, I, that's pretty much what they go to OPM for. And I suspect that's because they don't want OPM in their business unless they think they can help in some way. I think, and I'm hoping, uh, and I do believe that with Director Barry there, that maybe we're going to see a lot of changes in that arena. And if they can offer something that the agencies say, hey, that would really be helpful instead of me reinventing the wheel and, um, you know, and, and uh, having 33 hiring practices in 33 different agencies. If OPM can really pull something together that would be seen as helpful to the agencies, then I think things will change. And I also think uh, and believe that, uh, that OPM will, uh, when they look at this hiring process or whatever it is that the agencies can benefit from, I'm hoping that we will all be in that conversation. I have already had that conversation with Director Barry. I think the unions have an awful lot to offer on all of these issues. Uh, you know, will we agree on everything? Of course not. But 
get, let's get all the ideas on the table and get the best ones, uh, align ourselves behind them, and let's see, um, you know, let's help make some change happen. I think we have that potential. Yeah. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a couple of schools of these uh, inconsistencies in the current system right now that's in, in your jobs every day, trying to get fairness for the people that you represent. I also know there are some structural changes that, that the management end of this uh, operation also would like to get. Uh, I guess there, is two, there are two schools of thought. One is that you try to get some grand bargain, if you want to call it that, an omnibus type of uh, piece of legislation that tries to cure all the ills that we see in the current system and adopt rather progressive reforms at the same time and, and then we move forward together. Uh, there's another school of thought perhaps more pragmatic and, and, and born of experience that it's so hard to get change in this system. If you wait to try to get that type of grand bargain, you'll never get anything done. And so you might as well cherry pick the things that you can get done. Uh, do any of you have any ideas about what might be the better approach here, given your, your experience? I, I mentioned uh, the National Security Personnel System um, should be, and I, <laughs> I meant it, it, it really needs to be scrapped. But there, there was something that was very possible that, that could have happened out of it. That was passed by Congress. The unions that were affected got together, and 36 unions uh, formed a coalition, the United Defense Worker Coalition. Some were in the AFL-CIO, some were, you know, in Change the Winds, some were never affiliated with anybody. Uh, but it was the largest coalition of union in the history of the American labor movement. And we sat side by side and management came in because we were supposed to go through this whole process of saying, identifying problems and resolving them. The opportunity was, was glorious, it really was. The problem that came in, the management reps that came in really weren't serious about it and what they did was they had an initial proposal to put for us. Congress said, no, you need to meet and confer with the unions. So they went through that whole thing, took us about nine months, uh, maybe a year worth of uh, meetings and when we were all done they said, okay, here's, here's, our, here's our final proposal and it was with you know a column, a, a comma changed a semicolon, pretty much the same as what they initially wanted to do. But we really missed the golden opportunity there to say, okay, here are some problems inherent in our system. And we've got, I mean, just do some interest-based bargaining. It would have taken a long amount of time. But, you know, when they came to us and said, you know, here's what we see as a problem, for instance, with FLRA. Uh, and we said, well, we got that problem too. It, things take too long. How do we go about fixing it? Well, we, we, I think we could do that again. But if it's going to be simply ramming through who's got the power this week, uh, you know, and that's going to end up being the solution. We're not going to get there. Yeah. But I think that there were a lot of there were a lot of people. At least I can tell you, with all the unions, and I didn't agree with everything that they had to say, and they all didn't agree with me. But I think we could have ended up somewhere. And when I talked to some of the career people in management, I think that they felt the same thing. You know, that if we can get sort of the, uh, you know, the temporary elected uh, uh, heads out of here, we could really probably make something that works a lot better for the federal workforce and, the, and for the American people. So I, I think that that could be done. I think the first scenario could be done. You yeah. know, it, it'll take us a while, uh, but I think if we're committed to do it, we can make a better, we can make a better system. Okay, well, let's give it a shot. Uh, Ms. Simon? Um, this is not the answer anybody wants to hear, but um, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, um, Federal agencies have a lot of authorities and flexibilities. Um, you know, you'll, you hear at all these hearings about, oh, um, you know, we, we need to be able to do this, we need to be able to do that. There's a, a list as long as your arm of, of flexibilities that um, are authorized in law but are never funded. Likewise, um, we talk about the fact that there's still a pay gap of around 25 percent nationwide on average um, between federal and non-federal pay. Um, you know, all the, the answer to all of the problems that we, that we talk about here um, is, is more funding for the, for the flexibilities and the authorizations and the, and the pay system and the performance system and the opportunity to reward high performance. All of those things um, currently exist in, in, in the form of, of uh, authorities, but they're not funded and so they're not utilized. 
And so, you know, obviously the answer to, to the pay gap is, is funding our pay, our market comparability pay system. Um, you know, the answer to hiring enough people uh, to do all the kinds of things that we need to have a, a more efficient and effective government is, is to fund it. And, um, you know, that's the, that's the grand bargain. If I could just add, Chairman Lynch, I, I think we all know the stars are aligned a little different today than they were six months ago. And just when I think about this hearing, um, for the last eight years, um, the testimony from the first panel at any hearing would have been totally opposite the, uh, the, the panel that we're sitting on today. I mean, we knew that when we came in, we knew what to expect and we knew what we would hear. And there were no stars aligned and there was no support for the federal workforce. That's different today. So I think it's worth a shot. I think, uh, you know, is it a guarantee win? Uh, no, but the tone from the uh, White House, the tone from um, all of the political appointees, the heads of the agencies, um, the message from Congress, from the House and the Senate, I mean, it's, we're in a very different place. And um, so I think we need to acknowledge what didn't work before, but I do think we have opportunities now that we didn't have before. And uh, NTU is sure willing to roll up our sleeves and give it a shot. Okay, it's good to hear. Uh, you know, I, I have to be somewhat of, a, I'm, I'm somewhat of a pessimist, but I could be convinced. And, 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 and I, I gotta say, you folks have been banging your heads against the wall for a lot longer than I have. And uh, if you think there's a chance of this happening, then I'm, I'm with it. You know, I, I, I'm fully committed. I just wanted to make sure we were not on a fool's errand in terms of uh, trying to get this thing to work. If you think that there's an opportunity to make this work, then, 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 then I certainly support that. And, and I know that the, the director, uh, uh, Mr. Berry, is the one who has basically put it out there. And, 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 and I don't think he is talking about funding flexibilities within the current system. I believe what he was articulating is he wants to change the system itself, something more fundamental. And, and I know that he wants you at the table, uh, you know, to, to get your thoughts because of your experience uh, in this and having seen how it, it, you know, it has changed from administration to administration. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's dyslexic sometimes, you know, one group comes in and they have this approach and then you know, the next group comes in and they have a totally different approach. And, and uh, that, that can be maddening, I'm sure. But, you know, we've got to deal with the here and now. We've got, we've got basically four years ahead of us where we can get a consistent policy out of the White House and, and uh, out of the executive branch. And, and so we can work with that. Well, and there are a lot of moving parts to this. I mean, if we made a list of everything we've all identified today that we would like to change going forward, maybe the place to start is with the hiring process. Yeah. You know, start the conversation with everybody in the conversation who should be there, and let's see what we can do. That is an imminent crisis. I mean, we've all identified. and That would seem like so. a logical place to start, yeah. you know, and, and it would certainly impact what we talked about with, you know, whether it's 400 or 500,000 employees coming into the system, that would affect that next wave, and it would be, it would seem like a logical place to start. Uh, in, in closing, I, I just want to say I, I've given the previous panels an opportunity to, to amplify anything that, that uh, they think is important for the committee to hear and to go on the record. Uh, and so I, I'd like to give you each uh, an opportunity if there are things, you've, you've articulated yourself very well, by the way, but if there are things that I have missed or that you, you have not uh, put forward in your testimony yet, I'd just like to give you an opportunity, uh, President Kelly. Actually, the things I was going to say in response to that question that I knew you would ask us, I've already just, uh, oh, well, just put you. out there. Those, those. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, likewise, I don't want to stand between anybody else and their lunch, so I, I think yeah. we had ample you. opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. President Gentleman? I, I'm no fool. Um, <laughs> I, okay. I, I think it's, it's all been said and has been said quite well, and, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for your willingness to help the committee with this work. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day now. Put you right back at the table. I, think. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you. I gotta, I gotta go thank I got him. I gotta grab him. I'm gonna steal this water because I'm thirsty. So.
national security. It is essential that we tackle the annual deficit, and we have laid out an 